Today we celebrate this feast of Our Lady of Good Counsel. And most of us are familiar with this title of Our Lady from the Litany of Loretto, where we invoke her exactly, precisely, as Mother of Good Counsel. And this was inserted into the Litany of Loretto in 1903 by Leo XIII, a few months before he died. This title of Our Lady is particularly dear to the Friars of the Immaculate because it's under this title that our shrine, the shrine of our mother house, Frigento, Italy, is called the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Counsel in Frigento, Italy. Now, we need to understand, or we should try to understand, the significance of the title and why Our Lady bears this title of Mother of Good Counsel. Most often, she's thought of this for the last words that she expresses in the Gospel. The last words of Our Lady were those at Cana, when she said, Do whatever he tells you to the servants, and then, more mystically speaking, to every single one of us. Do whatever he tells you. And of course, this is the most perfect counsel that Our Lady could give us. She's also considered the mother of good counsel because she is the mother of the one whom Isaiah called the wonderful counselor. We remember the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9 when he says, And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, God the Mighty, the Father of the world to come, the Prince of Peace. Okay, so because our Lord bears this title of Wonderful Counselor, Our Lady is known as the Mother of Good Counsel. Now, in order to have a deeper understanding of this title of Our Lady, we need to first of all understand the virtue of prudence because it's the gift of counsel that completes and perfects the acquired virtue of prudence. Okay, so what, what is the virtue of prudence that is being perfected when the gift of counsel is put into action? Well, as the Catechism <coughs> explains, prudence is the virtue that disposes the reason, enlightened by faith, to discern our true good in every circumstance and to choose the right means of achieving it. Okay? This is the acquired virtue of prudence. Okay? I say acquired because we can all obtain or acquire this virtue by our own efforts, by our experience, by reflecting on the circumstances that have happened in the past and discerning, well, what would be the best thing to do now, here and now, according to the circumstances in which I find myself. And we need to notice, see, it says enlightened by faith. It's not just simple human reasoning without faith. Because we see that people without faith can be prudent, but prudent according to the ways of the world. And this is why the definition also mentions to discern our true good. Now, that is that which is truly good for us. For example, during the time of Lent, well, it takes faith to know that making certain sacrifices and mortifications, though not comfortable there and then at the moment, are nevertheless for our true good. Okay? This is the reason enlightened by faith. And it says, our true good in every circumstance, because we know that there are so many different situations that we can find ourselves in, so many different variables, uh, you know, that it's not always easy to figure out what is our true good in this certain circumstance. The people that we're dealing with, uh, our particular conditions, our state of life, etc. And then it says, not only to discern the true good, but also the means of achieving the true good. Okay? For example, if the true good that we desire for our friend 
is their conversion, okay, their belief in Jesus Christ and their salvation. Okay? We need to discern the means of obtaining that according to the circumstances, enlightened by faith. Now, it's faith that tells us that we can obtain that conversion, or above all, that conversion is a work of God's grace. And so we need to acquire grace to obtain that good, the good of their conversion. And so we start to think, again, enlightened by faith, that the most efficacious means of obtaining God's grace is the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And so prudence, our reason, enlightened by faith, would suggest to us to have Masses said for our friend who we desire to convert. And then also to pray for them, obtains God, obtain God's grace by our prayers, by our sacrifices. Now we could also consider the person's dispositions. Uh, for example, uh, if they tend to be argumentative and reject any sort of, uh, you know, they're, perhaps they're proudful or prideful, they wouldn't be open to any suggestions and things like that. Well, prudence would tell us it's best not to say anything and not to push them you know, farther away from the church than they already are. So if we can come to these conclusions just using, just with the virtue of prudence, then why is there need for the gift of counsel, the gift of the Holy Spirit? Because our acquired virtue, that virtue which we work toward to obtain by our own force, is always exercised in a human way. That is, it's always stained and tainted with our human weakness and our doubt and our insecurity. And we're not always sure and we're not always correct because we can err. And so the gift of counsel is the gift by which the Holy Spirit comes to our aid so that our actions are certain. You know, it's above all the work of God in these actions when the work of the Holy Spirit takes the primary place. Our, our actions or our deliberations become certain without doubt. There's a certain ease and also a certain joy in executing them. And so what we see how Our Lady, who is full of grace, the Immaculate Virgin, is always guided by the Holy Spirit. The gift of counsel was always in action in her life. And we see in Our Lady, in her life, also two effects of the gift of counsel. The first effect makes the person, the subject, docile <clears throat> to legitimate superiors. And this is kind of contrary to our way of thinking. Well, okay, if, if a person is filled with the gift of counsel, shouldn't they have all of the trust and confidence in their own judgments? But that's not the way the gift of the Holy Spirit works. But instead, it makes us, because true prudence seeks to obey those who have legitimate authority over us. And we see this in the life of the Virgin Mary. Wasn't she the one who was supremely docile above all to God? But then also to St. Joseph, who, as her husband, had legitimate authority over her. When St. Joseph said, as head of the Holy Family, get up, let's go, in the middle of the night, we're going out to Egypt on a long and difficult journey. We see that there is no protest on the part of Our Lady. She didn't interject and say, no, I'm immaculate. I'm more intelligent than you are. I cannot err with the help of... She didn't say that. But she was completely docile to the illegitimate authority of St. Joseph. Now, another effect of this gift of counsel is right judgment in governing others. And this is what particularly brings joy to our hearts. 
Because Our Lady is Mother of Good Counsel, but she's also Mother of the Church, Mother of all Christians, Mother of each and every one of us. That is, she governs us, especially those who have consecrated themselves to Our Lady. And she governs us with the aid of the gift of counsel of the Holy Spirit, never erring. And I just want to conclude with the words that we find in the first reading from the book of Ecclesiasticus that the church in the liturgy puts on the lips of Our Lady. He who listens to me will never be disappointed. He who lives by me will do no wrong. He who reads my lesson aright will find in it eternal life.